in the arena with Monsignor Kieran Harrington. Call in at 347-921-4NET. 347-921-4NET. Welcome back to In the Arena. I am Liz Fabless, and I am here once again with my esteemed co-host, Joe Concha. Always nice to work with you. Always good to know you at PayPal, and thank you for the compliment. <laughs> Appreciate it. The check cleared. Yes, it did. <laughs> Joe, as you know, June is Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month. Now, to help us in that mission, we've invited our next guest to the show. He is author Carlin Maddox, and he's here with us to share his own very, very personal experience of Alzheimer's disease. It's a journey that he shares in his book entitled A Path Revealed, How Hope, Love, and Joy Found Us Deep in a Maze Called Alzheimer's. Welcome, Carlin, very much for sharing the story. Um, I'm, ex- I'm very interested in hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Joe. Good to be with you today. I want to start by having you tell us about the beginning of this journey in this maze, as you call it, of Alzheimer's. We're talking, of course, about your wife, a very cherished member of your family. How was she diagnosed? Yes, Martha was 50 years old when she was diagnosed. This was an odyssey that went on for 17 years. Uh, She was diagnosed in September of 1997. And uh, we began to see um, something going on about a year before Martha was diagnosed. She was uh, running for an open seat in the Florida State Legislature. And when I saw her up on the stump with other panelists, uh, she was not fielding questions or handling questions the way that I'd seen her. She had been on the St. Petersburg City Council back in the 80s, and she was very cool, calm, publicly. But uh, this particular event in 96, it just was not happening. And we got, we got home, and I asked Martha, what was going on? And she thought everything was just fine. Mm -hmm. And so we began to notice that she was forgetting appointments. She was forgetting names more and more frequently over the course of the year. And finally got her in to see a neurologist to take some tests and uh, to come back with the uh, very unfortunate news that you have early onset Alzheimer's. Harlan, you have children. How how old were they at the time? And, And how did your entire family handle this? Difficult diagnosis. Yes, uh, Martha, as I said, was 50. I was 52. We had two children in college and one child in high school still. Mm -hmm. And so they were still relatively young. Uh, We, uh, when we got the news in the doctor's office, I looked at Martha and her confidence just faded away. It looked like she was retreating into her shadow to me and her bright blue eyes just turned dull Gray. And we got out of there as quickly as we could. We got home and, and, and had a long, hard cry. And then Martha said, I do not want to tell a soul. I don't want to tell our children. I don't want to tell my parents. I don't want to tell our friends. And that was just uh, a very hard to do. But I was willing to try to work with her on that uh, as, 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 best, as best I could. Carlin, I, w- I want to bring um, my co-host, Joe, in, who I know has a question. But I began this by saying I'm very interested in what Carlin has to say s- because of that point that you just made. It's such a stigma, and people don't want to talk about it. Joe, what, what is your take on that? I, I always selfishly put myself in these situations, Carlin, because I, I have a 4-year-old and, and a 2-year-old, 4-year-old daughter, 2-year-old son. And I see the world completely differently now. And I have this fear of mortality all of a sudden, where if I feel like a tightness in my chest, right, or suddenly I, I feel like I have to go to the doctor to be seen about something and there's a history of cancer in my family, I don't think of myself. I think of how are they going to handle me not being there? Because at least when they're four and they're two, you're the heroes, right? So as your wife began to go through this process, Carlin, um, I know you didn't tell your kids initially, but at some point, did you have to tell them something because they obviously would notice a change in behavior? Uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I, I, the only way I can describe it, just you're describing it in your own way, Joe, our world was not turned upside down. Our world was imploding before us, and we didn't know what the future held. I was scared. 
Martha's confidence, who was a very passionate, confident person, it was gone, her confidence was. And uh, we, I just didn't know where to turn. When, to get around to the children in just a minute, um, when we got home, after Martha said she didn't want to tell anyone, there was one person that she was willing to tell, and that was a, a friend and a retired Presbyterian minister. And we called Lacey Harwell over to the house, and he came the next day. And he then, uh, after we talked and had a, another long, hard cry, he said, you know, I have a friend up in Kentucky uh, who was with a uh, Catholic community there, a sister Elaine Prevale. She was, uh, was the retreat director at the Sisters of Loretta community. He said, I have sent a lot of my friends and members of my congregation to visit with her who are going through a crisis. I would strongly urge you to go. And so before we went, and uh, I had to tell our daughter in high school just what was going on and why we were doing this. Mm. She was the one who was closest to the problem at that point. And so we told her first. Uh, a few weeks after our visit with Sister Elaine in Kentucky, uh, we were going, we went up to North Carolina where both of our children were in uh, school. Uh, our daughter Rachel came over from Chapel Hill to Davidson where our son was. He had a swim meet. So at the appropriate time, Martha agreed we would tell them there. And that was obviously a very upsetting moment for all of us at that point. Carlin did any point during this crisis, did your faith ever suffer? Uh, I think it disappeared. Mm. Uh, I mean, I continued to believe in God, but what I learned over the course of these 17 years was there is a, there is a vast difference between believing in God and in believing God. And I didn't believed that we were being loved for our creator. Uh, I, I it just, there was, these symptoms are just too volatile. They just up and down, in and out, you get settled in on one and then something else shows up. And so I, I did ultimately experience in a very deep way, deep in the marrow of my bones, a lot God's love for me and for Martha and for our family. But it took a long while to get there. I bet. And, and can you tell us a little bit about the disease, Carlin? I mean, uh, how many people in the United States are actually diagnosed with it? Uh, how many are affected by it? And, and most importantly, and I'm sure you've done a ton of research on this, I know I would, uh, are we getting any closer to any kind of cure or better treatment of it? Right now, the latest statistics I've seen show that there are about uh, 5.7 million people who are uh, diagnosed with this, but they think a lot more people have not been diagnosed with Alzheimer's than 5.7. A total of 22 million, when you include the family caregivers, a total of 22 million are, are diagnosed with this. That's expected to grow, it's growing in epidemic proportions, it's expected to grow to 28 million within seven years unless there's some kind of intervention. And to answer your question about are they getting any closer, as far as I can tell, they are not. I mean, the issue is, what is the cause? And they haven't been able to determine what is the cause of this Alzheimer's. And uh, I think one of the reasons that the growth is happening is there are so many baby boomers who are moving into retirement age. Uh, and so that's having a direct impact. People are living longer. That's having another impact. Uh, and uh, so it's, they're spending a lot of money, doing a lot of research, but they're just not getting any closer. Carlin, uh, if I um, read in the paper that this, uh, this approach seems to be working with Alzheimer's, I go immediately to the bottom of the story, and I say, well, it's still at the mouse stage right now, and it's not any closer to uh, the human experience. Carlin, in the time we have left, um, can you talk just really briefly about some of the difficulties that caregivers face and what more can a caregiver do for a loved one? The, uh, some of the problems are just the volatility. And uh, it, it, for me, and I'm sure with a lot of caregivers, it generated stress, it generated anger, it generated bitterness, not knowing how to resolve this thing. 
The several things that I had to learn. One was I really had to ultimately figure out a way to allow some resource, as in God, greater than me, to lift us up above these symptoms. And that was extremely important in our path and our journey. Uh, the other thing I had to learn was I had to put myself into Martha's world now rather than try to operate in the world that we had been operating in and put myself in her shoes and try to understand what she was trying to convey and how she was trying to convey it. Uh, another thing that we learned from Sister Lane early on up in Kentucky was she had suggested that we check out meditations, which uh, we began to do. It was something that was totally foreign to me. I'd never experienced it, um, but um, we were directed to a Father John Main, a Benedictine monk, and the, I ordered his tapes and his book, and we began to meditate on a daily basis, and that I saw that Martha's anxiety level just diminished. Mine began to diminish. That's very interesting, yes. Carlin. And, and let me ask you one more question, and then fortunately we have to go in about uh, 30 seconds. Uh, behind you, uh, if people are uh, watching on Net TV and Skype, uh, is a painting, and I asked you before, uh, boy, that's beautiful. Who painted that not knowing the answer? And I'd I'm, I'm, uh, be happy for you to reveal that right now. Right. My wife got into watercolor painting about 18 months after the diagnosis. She had never been into painting. And that is, I call that her self-portrait. That is, the, the colors are vivid and bold. And I just uh, was totally amazed about the confidence rebuilt and, and how she, uh, how this really helped her get involved. All right, Carlin, thank you so much. I think that is, Joe, the perfect last word. We leave on that note, and we thank you so very sincerely for, for sharing your story with us and, and just for providing us more information about this disease, which remains a mystery yeah. to this point. So you don't Carlin, know the cause. Hard to get to the cure, as Carlin said. Exactly. Yeah. You, you said it right, Joe. Uh, thank you, Carlin, so much well, for joining with us, and um, we will be right back with Monsignor Harrington and his guest, Mira Bartok. Thank you.